Our last So You Want a Blank bike video back in October was a bit of a hit job on the Himalayan, and while I'm clearly not a fan of the bike, we made the point that while Royal Enfield might not be knocking on the leather of the ball, they're trying new things. It's in that spirit today, hot on the heels of the announcement that the GM is going to be converting its entire fleets of vehicles to electric, that we're going to be talking about electric motorcycles. Now I can feel the collective eye roll of all the over my cold dead body types who are adamant that it'll be a cold day in hell before they give up their gas burning motorcycle. But here's the truth, electric motorcycles are here to stay. If you can't handle that then the rest of the video is not going to change your mind so I guess just go bury your head in the sand or something. But for those of you who are open to the idea of electric motorcycles, we wanted to cover the history of electric bikes, explain some of the pros and cons, and talk about whether or not it's worth trading in your old gas guzzler for a new whisper quiet magic carpet with face melting torque. That's right, so you want a blank bike is back and we're definitely not going to be pissing anyone off at all, just like the old times. Okay, so electric motorcycles, where do they come from? Well, when a mommy motorcycle and a daddy motorcycle love each other very much and things get hot and heavy, then a decade later a Silicon Valley startup says they're going to revolutionize travel forever. That's the way it works. Obviously I'm kidding, but would you believe me if I told you that electric bikes first showed up in 1895? That's right, the very first patent for an electric bicycle was filed on September 19th, 1895 by a guy called Ogden Bolton Jr. And the first tandem electric bicycle was shown off at the Stanley Cycle Show in London a year later. So you see, originally gearheads thought the internal combustion engine was stupid, loud, maintenance intensive, pollution spewing boondoggles that would never catch on, and that electric motorcycles were the way of the future. Little did they know that it would take another century for people to catch on. Admittedly, two world wars and a great depression didn't exactly encourage experimentation into an unproven technology, and there's a whole lot more behind that that we're not going to get into in today's video. Now that doesn't mean that people weren't attempting to make it work. In 1967, Carl Kordesh made a hybrid electric motorcycle in the Indian Motorcycle Company, the reanimated corpse of Indian, we've got an entire video breaking that one down if you're interested, experimented with an electric prototype they called the Papoose. However, the first mass-produced electric motorcycle wasn't available until 1996, when Peugeot released its Scoot Elec. This little scoot was powered by a 2.8 kilowatt or 3.8 horsepower electric motor. Funny thing about electric motors is that you actually don't measure them in displacement since they don't have empty space inside the motor. The scoot weighed in at 254 pounds, which is heavy for such a wimpy little motor, and it only had a range of 25 miles with a top speed of 28 miles per hour. But for the first ever production electric motorcycle, that's not bad considering some of the bikes we have nowadays. But what about the big fish in the electric market? Zero motorcycles. They got their start in 2006, started by a former NASA engineer by the name of Neil Saiki. They teased and tested a handful of models and released their first bike, the S, in 2010. Now I'm going to focus a lot on the Zero S here because it's been out for 10 years and we're going to chart a decade's worth of progress and then compare it to a decade's worth of progress in gas bikes. The 2010 Zero S launched with a range of 50 miles and a top speed of 70 miles per hour. It could reach its top speed from a standing start in under 4 seconds. Yeah, not that impressive compared to sport bikes 0 to 60s, but hey, it only made 30 horsepower. Its battery could be charged by any house socket, which was a neat feature, but it cost $3,000 to get a new one. Back in the day, it would cost you $8,995, which is a lot of money for what it was. The 2014 model year included a bump in power up to 54 horsepower and 68 foot-pounds of torque, with a range of 171 city miles and 90 miles per hour top speed. It also featured optional battery packs, each with an increased range and charge times. It also got ABS, updated LCD dash, improved suspension and brakes, app connectivity, and more. That model cost $12,995, which is a substantial jump in price, but considering what you got, it was worth it. The 2020 model year claims a max range of 223 miles in the city and puts down 46 horsepower and 78 foot-pounds of torque, and the price fell to $10,995. So broad stroke in it for those of you with short attention spans the range saw a 346% increase, horsepower increased by 43%, and torque increased by 30% as well. Not to mention the price was only increased by $2,000. Now how about another motorcycle we all love? The Yamaha R1, the biggest baddest leader bike coming out of Japan. Well in 2010 it cost you $14,500 putting down 182 horsepower and 85 foot pounds of torque. Skipping the middle years and jumping straight into the modern bike, the 2020 R1 put down 197 horsepower and 83 foot pounds of torque and it cost you $17,399. That's an 8% increase in horsepower, a 3% loss in torque, and an increased price of 
$399. Now, I know what you're saying because leader bike simps are nothing if not predictable. Oh, but yams, the increase in price is because of the increase in tech. Nope, modern e-bikes have the same tech. Look guys, like it or not, we've basically reached the peak of what naturally aspirated motorcycle engines can make. If you keep boosting compression, eventually they'll just become so unreliable as to not even be rideable. And if you start slapping turbos on everything, as much fun as that sounds, you're still not going to be overcoming the fact that the engines themselves don't have anything more to give. If you want proof, just take a look at the MotoGP times year over year versus Moto E. Electric motorcycles are the future and they are here to stay. Now let's assume you've come to terms with that reality and are wondering what an electric bike is like to ride. Well, wouldn't you know, I made an entire video capturing our raw first impressions riding an electric motorcycle. Eurocycles hooked us up with a Zero SRF, which is basically a top spec naked bike, which we still have in the shop, and they've been sending us all sorts of wild and crazy bikes to check out in the channel. They've sent us a Tuono, an MV Agusta F3800 Reparto Corsa, a Motor 2 Daytona 765, and we're swear we get a lot of our giveaway bikes. Click that link below and check them out. Now, assuming you're too lazy to watch the video we made and you just want to keep watching this one, riding an electric motorcycle is not at all like riding a conventional motorcycle. There's no clutch, there's no gears to shift, there's no exhaust note, and sure, these bikes make a ton of torque, but it doesn't come on the way you might think. It's not a massive lowdown punch that lifts the front wheel, it's more of a constant surge of power carefully doled out by the computer. You see, back in the day, people learned the hard way that the mid-range punch in an electric bike was nothing short of savage. It was basically an instant how to commit die, and they included more computers than NASA's mission control to keep the bike from instantly yeeting itself into the great beyond. What this causes is a very disconnected riding experience. You tell the bike to go faster by twisting the throttle, and the bike takes a second to think about it, and then it happens. You feel like you're not controlling the bike so much as you are along for the ride, and also the range is abysmal. Now I will say that we initially tested the bike on a cold day, and cold weather kills e-bike batteries a lot faster, but I can ride a gas bike in the winter and not worry about it. The SRF claims a 100 mile highway range at 50 55 miles per hour, we got about 65 miles out of it. Not to mention the whole time we were riding, we were watching the range tick down and worried about whether or not we'd make it back to the shop before it ran out. Again, we were riding faster than 55 miles an hour, but I can ride a gas bike at 70 miles an hour and not worry about anything. Finally, it handles a bit strange, basically because the battery is so heavy and it's so low down and the bike's center of gravity is in a different place than you might expect, which makes it a little less intuitive to ride. Now that I've said all the bad stuff, let me say that it was still a very cool riding experience. Since it doesn't make any noise, nor at least it doesn't make enough noise to hear over the wind noise, it's a very zen experience. You glide through the air and you find yourself less focused on the road and riding and more enjoying the scenery and soaking in the experience. Also, the torque is phenomenal. Yeah, it's not a face-melting wall of torque, but it's still 140 foot-pounds. It doesn't matter how many computer nannies you have. If you whack the throttle open on that, it's going to make you giggle in your helmet. Finally, since there's no engine vibrations, you feel so connected to the road. You can feel every single crack and imperfection. You can almost hear your tires gripping the ground. It's a one-of-a-kind riding experience, and I highly recommend that you take a spin on an electric bike if you get the chance. Oh, and before I forget, electric motorcycles basically require no maintenance. Check your tires, your brakes, your forks, and a couple other things here and there, and you're good to go. There's no valve clearance checks, no fuel injection system to check. It's all stuff any garage mechanic can do. Now, to finish this video out, let's talk about about some of the models of electric bikes you can buy because Zero is not the only game in town anymore. If you want a Zero, I'd recommend the SR. It's a nice happy medium between the SRF at 20 grand and the low range of something like the FXX, which can only get 70 miles in the city. The SR puts down 116 foot-pounds of torque, weighs in at 414 pounds, and has a city range of 179 miles. You've got the option of a charge tank, which speeds up your charge time to two hours from empty to full, or the range tank, which gets you 223 miles of range in the city. The bike costs $15,495 and the optional tanks cost another $2,600, so that's definitely not cheap. But when you factor in the cost of maintenance or lack thereof, gas and government rebates, that price does start to come down in the long run. But what if you want the Ducati of electric motorcycles? Money is no object, then you would get yourself the Energica Ego, which is pretty fitting if you think about it. It's putting down 145 horsepower and 159 foot-pounds of torque, and it can go from 0 to 60 in 2.6 seconds. In the city, you'll do 249 miles on a single charge but that power and range combo is going to cost you 23,870 bucks. 
It's worth pointing out that Energica is the bike supplier for Moto E in 2022, so if you want to get the bike that the pros ride, that's the closest you can get. Lastly, let's talk about the Lightning LS218, the fastest electric bike on the planet. The 218 makes 200 horsepower and 168 foot-pounds of torque with a top speed of 218 miles per hour. Before you put your deposit, the 218 costs $38,888. So yeah, but hey, nothing will be able to catch you for about 100 miles. Are electric bikes flawed? Yes deeply. Our infrastructure is not in place to handle taking anything longer than a 50 mile weekend ride on an e-bike and when the tank runs out you have to wait hours for the charge versus seconds and a refill at a gas station and they're crazy expensive. But think about it this way. The OG iPhone is hot garbage compared to the one we have today, and it first came out in 2007. In 13 years, we've gone from like 8 gigs of storage and barely enough battery life to get a phone through a call. If the electric bikes that we have today are the 2007 iPhone, just imagine what they'll look like in 13 years from now. The future of electric motorcycling is going to be very exciting, and we are very interested in talking about it here on Yami Noob. Fact! Honey hunters in Mozambique use special calls to recruit the service of birds known as honey guides. The birds lead the humans to bees' nests, and in return, they get leftover beeswax. That's what I call a symbiotic relationship. Goodbye. Keep watching Yammy Noob. 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 Keep watching Yammy Noob.